So the first thing we need to decide is whether we're going to have, um, thanks, Tom, um, uh, the homework due Wednesday as stated on the web. Um, we, so is, it, is that all right? I, I know one person's already turned in another assignment. Um, can we wait till Monday to decide? Okay, is there a second? <laughs> All right, we'll wait for Monday, but let's not, well, you know, let's not put things back too much because the way you learn is by doing uh, homework. And um, you know, we don't want to make it, make it too easy. So let me first of all review some of the things we learned last time and then use yellow chalk for the review. Find J plus or minus equal to J one plus or minus I J two. Um, we saw that uh, J three J plus is equal to H bar J plus. And in fact, we can compactify this by saying plus or minus, plus or minus, plus or minus. We also found that the commutator of J plus with J minus was 2H bar J3. Um, as usual, asking questions is an important part of the learning process and the teaching process. So if I can, if I start asking questions, I mean, the idea is for you guys to ask the questions. We found that J plus J minus is this, and in the opposite order, it's a similar structure. by adding these two together, we found that j squared was equal to a half j plus j minus plus j minus j plus uh, plus, let me just say, plus j3 squared there. Um, I noticed last night in my notes that, um, looking over my notes that, um, I really could have said something a little bit uh, clearer about some of these things. In any event, we found that uh, j dot j in any state psi was greater than or equal to zero. So that means that if jm is an eigenstate of j squared, then, whoops, let me, let me do that a little bit better. And if psi is equal to jm, then this is greater than or equal to zero. And so if in particular j squared jm is equal to alpha jm, then this is equal to alpha, which is greater than or equal to zero, we decided to set alpha equal to j, j plus one, h bar squared is j greater than or equal to zero. And, um, that's the way we proceeded, and we we then um, considered j squared on j m, h bar squared j j plus one j m and j three 
JM, H bar, M, JM. So these are the two equations that we set out to analyze with the aid of these equations, which we derived from the fundamental angular momentum computation relations. And we found various things about these. In particular, we found that M had to lie between minus J and plus J. And then we found that by considering the norm of J plus on the state JM, assuming it's an eigenstate of these two variables, these two quantities, which of course commute, because this is a scale of J3 commutes with J squared, we found that this was equal to H bar squared J minus M, J plus M plus 1. And that has to be greater than or equal to zero. And we also found that J minus on JM, which here we use these two equations and then factorize the resultant expression. And this turned out to be J plus M, J minus M plus 1. That's greater than or equal to zero. So we have these two inequalities. And this told us that JM can't exceed J and M can't be less than minus J. And so that proved this relation here. Any questions? I do have, oh, here I forgot to pass out the crackers. I don't know who wants to take the crackers. Here, let me toss them to you. I also do have still a little bit of chalk, but there's a reward for anybody who has a question. Chalk that I picked up at a Japanese restaurant. Okay, so this particular relation here, this bottom one here tells us that if M is equal to minus J, then this expression is zero. And so that told us that the J minus on the state J minus J was just equal to zero. We also knew, of course, that J can be used with J minus. And we used that to show that J squared on J minus JM was equal to H bar squared J, J plus 1, J minus on JM. And that tells us that this state is an eigenstate of J squared with eigenvalue H bar squared J, J plus 1. So in other words, when you act with J minus, you don't change the eigenvalue of J squared because J minus can be used with J. And that's because J squared, J squared is a scalar. We then showed that J3 on J minus JM was equal to H bar M minus 1, J minus JM. So that tells us that this state J minus JM is an eigenstate of J3, but not with eigenvalue MH bar, but with eigenvalue M minus 1 H bar. So it's 1 down. And so that's basically the review of last time. Any questions about that? Or about anything else? More or less relevant to physics. OK, now we want to fool around with J plus. So the first thing, I guess, is to go back to this expression here and show and see that if we set M equal to J, then we get 0. So that tells us that J plus, I should start with the white chalk now, I guess, since we're no longer reviewing. 
J plus on JJ is equal to zero. Which is, in other words, you can't lower the state J minus J to get zero. You can't raise the state J, J. And that's just by plugging M equal to J in this equation, this term is zero. The next thing is that, of course, J squared commutes with J plus because J squared is a scalar. And so that applied to the state JM gives us, again, we're assuming, we're always assuming these two equations. And then this gives us J plus J squared JM. What am I doing here? I somehow skipped something. Yeah, I skipped something. This is certainly zero. So now what we can do is we can say J squared on J plus JM using this commutator is equal to J plus J squared on JM. And J squared on J plus JM by this equation is H plus squared J, J plus one on JM. So that tells us, whoops. Sorry. So that tells us that the state J plus JM is an eigenvector of J squared with the same eigenvalue as any of the other states. So J plus does something to JM, but it doesn't change the eigenvalue with respect to J squared, just a J minus thing. Okay. The next is to use the fact that J3 J plus is H bar J plus. And then we apply that to the state JM and we get J3 J plus on JM is equal to H bar J plus on JM. And so this gives us J plus J3 JM is equal to J plus J3 JM plus H bar J plus JM. Well, J3 on JM by this equation is J plus H bar M JM. And this is plus H bar J plus JM. And so this is just clearly H bar times M plus one J plus one JM. And that tells us that this state is an ideal state of J. Oh, I did it backwards. What the? No, yeah, I wrote this backwards. The thing is right, but I wrote it backwards. Right, this is the commutator. So the first term is J3 J plus minus J plus J3. And I put that term over here. And so the state J plus JM is an ideal state of J3 with this eigenvalue. In other words, one up. Okay. So now we've learned a lot about these states. And we're almost done. We know that M has to lie between minus J and J. And consequently, we can set M equal to J minus X, where X is non-negative. That will satisfy this relation. And we can say M is equal to J minus J plus Y 
So y is greater than or equal to 0. And that, that gives us this relation. Of course, we don't want to make x and y too big. But now if we add them together, we get that 2m is equal to um, x plus y. But before, before doing that, I, again, I skipped ahead in my notes here. Before doing that, uh, what can x and y be? Can they be imaginary numbers? No, because the eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator are real, so they have to be real numbers. Um, so could they be something like um, 1 over root 2, or even something as common as 1 half? Well, if x were 1 half, suppose x were 1 half, then, for example, we could look at this equation, which says j3, j plus jn is equal to h bar m plus 1, j plus jn. And if we apply that, say, to the state j, say x equal to, x equal to uh, 1 half, this would then be j3, j plus j, j minus 1 half equals h bar, m is j, so this uh, m is j minus a half plus 1 would be j plus a half, j plus j, j minus a half. But this would say that there's an eigenstate, namely j plus j, j minus a half, of J3 with an eigenvalue here, in other words, m equals j plus a half, which is greater than j. But this that would violate the rule we found over here, the bounds on m. So that tells us that x couldn't be, say, a half, and or any fraction like that. What about if x is an integer? Well, if x is an integer, it's OK, because um, for example, if we had, we wouldn't get into a contradiction if we had, for example, m equal to zero. I mean, I mean um, j minus zero, because then we'd have j plus on jj is zero, and that wouldn't get us into this problem. Um, if we instead had x equal to, say, minus one instead of minus a half, then this would have gotten us simply to h bar j, and we would have raised the state j, j minus 1, just to the state j, j, by using j plus. So what this tells us then is that x and y are integers. Now when we add them together, we get that 2m is equal to um, x plus y, but more importantly, um, more importantly, let's write these equations slightly differently, namely j is equal to m plus x, and j is equal to, or minus j is equal to m minus, let me get that one, minus j is equal to m minus x. Ah, I want j. j is equal to minus m plus j. All right. I should really rehearse it. Uh, j is equal to minus m plus y. Adding the two together, we get 2j is equal to x plus y, which is then an integer. So j is equal to an integer divided by 2. And this, of course, is the um, really surprising result that comes out of um, this analysis. Um, this result is really not, I mean, it is a result in quantum mechanics, but it's also a result in Lie algebra theory. And um, 
if we had been doing this simply from the point of view of group theory, we wouldn't have introduced H bar at all. We only introduced H bar because we wanted to have the operator that generates rotations be e to the minus i theta dot j annual momentum. And so we had to put in an H bar to make this thing dimensionless. If we were studying this thing purely as a Lie algebra thing, we would have had this be e to the minus i theta dot just the ratio of these two, which we would have called, let me say, script j. And then we would have gotten the same result for eigenvectors of script j squared and script j3, namely that j had to be an integer over 2. And so the possibilities then are 0, not only an integer, but a non-negative integer. So I should have said non-negative. So the possibilities are 0, 1 half, 1, 3 halves, 2, and so forth. And the cases where you have 0, 1, 2, 3, these things are called bosons, at least if they're only integer particles, or if they're just systems where the total annual momentum is, the total j column number is 0, 1, 2, or 3, or whatever, those are bosons, and then these guys are fermions. And as you know, there are radical differences in the properties of these two kinds of systems. Bosons are like sheep. The fermions are like cats. The bosons are like huddled together in the same state. The fermions have to be in anti-symmetric states. And therefore obey the Pauli exclusions and so forth. So we've seen the values of m run from minus j to plus j in integer steps. Integer steps is what we saw over here, namely that we lower by 1, or over here we raise by 1, so those are certainly integer steps. And so m, the values of m differ from j by an integer, and j itself is, as I said, a non-negative integer divided by 2 half, a non-negative integer. If you count up the number of possibilities, then if you have one state, and now let's think about a state, a quantum mechanical state that has some other quantum numbers, and then j, and then m, there will be 2j plus 1 of these states, which you can start at the top one, jj, and then you act on that with j minus on jj, and that will be some constant times j, j minus 1, and so forth, and then you can go all the way down to the state j minus j, and altogether there are then 2j plus 1 of these states. So if j is 0, there's only 1. If j is a half, like for the electron, simply the spin part of the electron, then you have two states, namely 1 half and minus 1 half. If you have a massive vector particle, then you have j equal 1, and you can have j equal 1, 0, or minus 1. All right, now a little bit about that normalization. We saw, well, let's just write this down. j plus jm is then some constant times j, m plus 1. So what's the constant? Well, jm, j minus j plus jm is going to be absolute value of c squared times jm plus 1, jm plus 1. But these states we're going to take to be normalized, and so this is just equal to c squared. 
squared. On the other hand, this thing is equal to uh, j minus j plus. We have that written somewhere here. j minus j plus is j squared minus j3 squared minus h bar j3. And so we substitute that in here. We have jm times uh, j squared minus j3 squared minus j3 um, and minus plus is minus um, h bar j3 jm and that's equal to jm h bar squared j j plus 1 uh, minus and h bar uh, minus uh, what am I doing here? Minus well, this is squared, sorry. So this is minus mh bar squared and then this one is minus um, m h bar squared jm and uh, all together that's h bar squared jm times j j plus 1 minus uh, m m plus 1 jm. The state jm though is assumed to be normalized so this is h bar squared times j j plus 1 minus m m plus 1 and people usually factorize this uh, or rather well after they do it that way Okay, so this C, in other words, is the square root of this thing, and conventionally we take the positive square root, so J, J plus 1 minus M, M plus 1. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the expression, in other words. This is equal to H bar, square root of J, J plus 1 minus M, M plus 1 times J M plus 1. So this is the this is one of the key equations that goes into finding these coefficients which are called uh, they're named after Klepsch and Gordon. Unfortunately, very few people can spell Klepsch and I'm not one of them. So I'm not going to spell that for you. But anyway, um, so we have this uh, basic rule that is called convention. H bar, well, remember, you might say, well, what's this about a convention? You remember the overall phase of quantum state doesn't, isn't measurable, so we're allowed to have certain conventions. And this one is. Universal. Not all the conventions having to do with angular momentum are universal, though. All right, so that's uh, that's that's that, and if we take the inner product of that with the state uh, J m plus one, we get J plus J m like that, introducing the h bar times the square root. Again, we're requiring that the states are normalized. So in other words, deriving this rule and some of the other rules that I'm about to derive, um, deriving it, I'm assuming that all the states are normalized. If they're normalized, then this is what it is. If instead this state is has norm 3 and this has norm 36, then clearly C has to be something a lot different from what I wrote down. But we all, uh, it's a universal convention that they're normalized. If we now take the complex conjugate of this equation, we get Jm of J minus J m plus 1 is the same thing, h bar square root of J, J plus 1 minus m. Um, but normally we like to have what J minus does on the state Jm, so we subtract 1 from M in this equation, and we get J M minus 1, J minus 
Jn equals h bar, and the square root changes to, well, it's factorized now. J minus m plus 1, j plus m. And, in fact, if I factorize this, then this is h bar square root of j minus m, j plus m plus 1. And, for that matter, that's the same thing as this, because this is a complex function. So, equals ditto, and this is a bounded ditto. In other words, this is equal to. All right. Now, in fact, when we have this equation here, we see that the state j minus jm, we know is an eigenstate of j3 with eigenvalue. In other words, j3, j minus jm is equal to h bar m minus 1, j minus jm. And so this state is orthogonal to all the other eigenvectors of j3 with different eigenvalues. And so we can simply write j minus 1 jm is equal just to h bar square root of j minus m plus 1, j plus m, just times the state j m minus 1. So that's basically the last equation of this set of equations. All right. Well, this was all very mathematical. As I said, it's really part of the algebra. Let me once again invite questions before I start a new topic. All right. The new topic is to make some contact with the sort of, well, with spherical coordinates and with the sort of formalism that we would use for discussing Schrodinger's equation for the hydrogen atom or for any central potential, central spherically symmetric potential. Potential spherically symmetric, and of course, what we want is to use spherical coordinates. All right. Well, a change in position, dr, is going to be in rectangular coordinates. It's x hat dx plus y hat dy plus z hat dz. Hat means unit vector. So this just means x hat times x hat is equal to 1. Okay. This thing we can also write, though, as r hat dr plus r theta hat d theta plus r sine theta phi hat d phi. So that's the idea of spherical coordinates. We've got the x axis out here, the y axis there. This is the z axis. This angle here is theta. If you drop this down to the x, y plane, then this angle is phi. And r hat, then, is a unit vector that points this way. Theta hat is a vector this way. And, in fact, it's a vector in the direction of increasing theta. And phi hat is what happens when you increase phi. And so phi hat is in the board. Well, not quite in the board. It's sort of that. Okay. Now, I'm going to write 
R hat, theta hat, and phi hat in terms of x hat, y hat, and z hat. And I guess I'm just going to, I'm not going to derive these, but they're certainly plausible. Sine theta cos phi plus y hat sine theta sine phi plus z hat cos theta. Theta hat is x hat cos theta cos phi plus y hat cos theta sine phi minus z hat cos theta. And then phi hat is minus x hat sine phi plus y hat, well, it might be better than that, y hat cos phi. Okay, so you see here that phi hat, since it points that way, is perpendicular to z hat, so there's no z hat component in phi hat. You see that these three vectors are all, these are an orthonormal triplet. What can I say? This is in fact, this quantity here, for example, is the x component of r hat, this is the y component of r hat, and this, of course, is the z component of r hat. I'm talking about the magnitude here. And the same thing for theta and phi. Theta and phi are a little bit harder to figure out, but this is basically the rule. Okay. Any questions? Do you want me to try to justify this a little more, or should we just move on? Okay, the inverse relations can be obtained by just saying, for example, that x hat is equal to x hat dot r hat times r hat plus x hat dot theta hat times theta hat plus x hat dot phi hat times phi hat. So that's pretty clear. In other words, just as x hat, y hat, z hat form a basis, so do r hat, theta hat, and phi hat, and those are the components. Well, if we just take, if we just dot, if we just calculate this by forming the dot product of x hat with r, well, x hat dot r, the only component is the first one, so that's just sine theta cosine phi. And this way what we find out is that x hat is equal to sine theta cos phi r hat plus cos theta cos, that's supposed to be cos phi, cos phi theta hat, and then minus sine phi phi hat, and then y hat is equal to sine theta sine phi r hat plus cosine theta sine phi theta hat plus cosine phi phi hat. So this is just taking the dot product of y hat with all these, with theta hat and x hat and theta hat, r hat, and phi hat, and so forth. Similarly, z hat is equal to cosine theta r hat minus sine theta theta hat. 
This one's the easiest one because we take, we have here z hat dot r gives us this one, z hat dot theta hat gives us this one, but z hat dot phi hat is zero, so that doesn't Okay, so this is the basic geometry. Now let's go on and add a little bit of calculus. Let me get a key. So the gradient, let me go over here. The gradient operator is defined in this way. Dr dot rad f is the change in f. And the change in f is certainly dr times partial f partial r plus d theta times partial f partial theta plus d phi, change in phi, times partial f partial phi, that's for sure. But then that must mean that this is dr dot and dr is over there. It's r hat dr plus r theta hat d theta plus r sine phi, plus sine theta d phi times phi hat. You need phi hat. Dot it into grad f. And so what we see here is that grad f then is equal to r hat just partial partial r plus theta hat. Now with theta hat, the part that's theta hat, there has to be a piece that cancels r in order to just give us this. So it is 1 over r partial partial theta and then plus phi hat and then 1 over r sine theta partial partial phi. That's to cancel this term. So that gives us what the gradient is. And so the gradient operator by itself, in fact that's what I, I'm sorry, that's all of this times hat, but the gradient operator by itself is what's inside the in fact if I use the shorthand then it's theta hat over r d theta plus phi hat over r sine theta and phi. So is this notation all right? The d sub partial symbol sub r means this and partial theta means that and partial phi means that. All right. Okay, well we know that the angular momentum is r cross p and if we have a state here r and this is l and then an arbitrary state, so this is a position eigenstate, then in this case what we would have is this is r, this is r cross p sine, this is r operator, this is the eigenvalue, so this becomes the eigenvalue cross r p sine, but p is represented by h bar over i times the gradient, so this is h bar over i r cross and now the gradient operator, I'm going to write the gradient operator, well let me just write it as gradient operator first, and so r sine is what we would call the stationary state wave function, 
for the state sign. <sighs> this really eats up blackboard. Um, can you guys see if I write here? If I read this line, can you guys see or is this too low? That's fine. You can see, Sid? I mean, can you see? All right. Um, so what this is, is h bar r, length of r, over i, r hat cross, and now I'm using the gradient here, and the gradient is r hat partial r plus theta hat over r partial theta plus p hat over r sine theta partial p, all of that acting on the wave function. By this argument, that the gradient was this in spherical coordinates. We let R, L equal R cross P. We take the matrix element of L, L. We pull out the R. It's an eigen, it's a, this is an eigenstate of R, so this just pulls out an R. P is represented by H bar over I grad. And then I just write the gradient in spherical coordinates. But now, R hat cross R hat is zero. R hat cross theta hat is phi hat. And R hat cross phi hat is minus theta hat. And so this is equal to h bar over i. Moreover, we have a, this R cancels these two R's. So there's a lot of simplification here. This becomes simply phi hat partial with respect to theta minus theta hat over sine theta partial with respect to phi, all that acting on the wave function R sine. Okay. So that's what L is. R L sine is just this in spherical coordinates. And that kind of makes sense because it is um, something that just involves changing the angles. And it's kind of nice that it's an expression without any R in it. Okay. So that's what you, that's what you sort of intuit. But when you look at it as R cross D in rectangular coordinates, it doesn't look like this at all. Right, now we want to go a little bit further with this. But if there's a question, remember, I do have chocolate to reward questions. So if there are any questions, and what kind of chocolate doesn't count as a question? Um, all right. Uh, if any of you guys understand why nobody asks questions, I wish you'd explain it to me uh, after the class. And uh, by the way, as far as all the scholars are concerned, anytime you see me, you can come up to me and ask me a question. And I'm around afternoons and evenings. All right. What about, um, so this is the whole picture for L. What about just LZ? Well, R, LZ, psi. This would be R z hat dot L sine. And so this is equal to z hat dot h bar over i phi hat d theta minus theta hat over sine theta. Sorry about writing so small, but this is the wave function. Okay. Right, that's invisible, I guess. Um, now, what about z hat dotted into these things? Well, z hat dot phi hat is zero. Z hat dot theta hat is minus cosine theta. 
Wait a minute. Why are you supposed to? Do I have that right? Let me just make sure. Page 8. Ah, yes. This is wrong. I made a mistake here. Somebody should have told me on this. This is a sign. So, Z hat dot theta hat is minus sine theta. And so this is simply the Z hat dot that is minus sine theta. So that cancels. So this is just H bar over I D by D phi of R sine. And that's something you've probably seen before. The components of LX and LY are a little bit more complicated. But this isn't deep stuff. It's just a question of using all those geometrical relations in a logical way. And so you should work through this on your own because I think I will assign some sort of homework, second homework assignment for this. So let's look at R LX sine. Well, of course, this is just R. No, I don't know why I did that. And, of course, this is X hat dot H bar over I D hat D theta minus minus theta hat over sine theta D phi on R sine. Okay. Well, what is X hat? Well, let's just put the H bar I out there. X hat using that top equation over there, this, and notice the only part of X hat that we need here is, let's see, I only used, I didn't use the R hat part. Oh, I didn't use the R hat. Let me see here. Right, I didn't use the R hat part because the R hat part is perpendicular to these two. So all I need here is cosine theta, cosine phi, theta hat minus sine phi, phi hat, all that dotted into this, which is then phi hat D theta minus theta hat over sine theta D phi. And we can call this psi of R just as well, right? It's a little bit easier to write. And now we're just taking this dot product. And so theta hat gives a non-zero component here, and these two give a non-zero component. The rest of it is zero. And so this is just H bar over I minus sine phi D theta minus cotangent theta cos phi D phi times psi of R. So that's an expression that I know the first time I saw this or an equivalent expression, I thought, gee, that was pretty weird. Where the hell did cotangent come from? But we see it comes out very naturally because we've got a cosine and a sine, and theta the hat dot theta hat is one. So that's where it comes from. Okay, we can do the same thing with LY. Let me start down here. R hat LY psi is then, let me just skip a step and pull out the Y hat. It's Y hat dot 
R L sine. So this is y hat, or better yet, let me pull out the h bar over i. h bar over i, y hat dot, and the angular momentum part here is just this structure here. P hat d theta minus theta hat over sine theta d phi on psi of r. And now we have to look up what y hat is. Well, y hat has a component involving r hat, but that's irrelevant because it's perpendicular to these two. So we just take the theta phi components of y hat, and that gives us um, h bar over i cosine theta sine phi theta hat plus cosine phi phi hat. It's very hard to write with this chalk when you're when it's too low. And then just phi hat this whole thing. Phi hat d theta minus theta hat over sine theta d phi. Again, on this, just call it psi of r. Okay, now taking the dot product, we get a component from that and a component from this, and the rest is zero. Cross terms is zero. And so that gives us that r l y psi is h bar over i cosine p d by d theta minus cotangent theta sine p d phi on r psi. I put back r psi because you don't want psi over here. All right, so that's what Ly is. Um, now you remember when we did this analysis of the um, basically the Lie algebra of angular momentum, we didn't use j of course x y z here over here uh, went into one two three. Um, I didn't mention that explicitly, but I assume you realize that. You notice that we didn't use, we used J3, but we didn't use J1 and J2, which would be LX and LY here. Instead, um, we formed these complex linear combinations, J1 plus IJ2. So two here, we'll be talking about uh, L plus and L minus. It turns out they have a simple form. So let's look at L plus or minus on the side, which is to say R. Lx plus or minus i Ly psi. Well, just combining, um, where is it? Uh, this formula with that formula, what we get, and let's see, we're getting things a little bit. Okay, so R L plus or minus psi is h bar over i times minus sine phi plus or minus i cosine phi d by d theta minus cotangent theta cosine phi plus or minus i sine phi d phi I guess I do need a big bracket here. And I'm just going to write this as psi of r. Alright, well you can see that this part here is just e to the plus or minus i phi. Which should bring a bell from the elementary quantum course. This one you need to massage a little bit. And uh, when you do, what you get is h bar over i e to the plus or minus i phi 
plus or minus I d by d theta minus cotangent theta d by d phi on R psi. All right. Frankly, um, the way to, so this part is pretty easy to do from there to there. This one is more confusing because you have to factor out an i or plus or minus i. And um, if you do the plus case, then you can see that um, when you factor out the i, um, to get this minus sign, you need what's left is cosine phi plus i sine phi, and that gives you the e to the plus i phi. With the minus case, we put in the minus sign. Do, do the arithmetic explicitly at home, and you'll see that it works. All right, well, that's a, that's a surprisingly simple expression, given that there were other expressions more complicated, that namely that R L plus or minus on psi is e to the i plus or minus, e to the plus or minus i p, h of r over i, and then this d by d theta with a plus or minus i and a minus cotangent theta d by d p. So it's reasonable, it's, a, it's simpler than one could have expected. Um, now, we have this general relation that j squared is a half j plus j minus plus j minus j plus plus j3 squared. So we have the same relation for L squared, namely that L squared, the vector, it's not written very well, but I guess you know what I mean, is a half L plus L minus plus L minus L plus plus L3 squared. And one can then show that R, in fact, I think I'll make this a homework problem. R L squared psi is equal to minus H bar squared, uh, 1 over sine squared theta, D, I'm just going to kneel down. D by D phi squared plus 1 over sine theta D theta of sine theta D theta all that acting on R psi. Okay, so that's the angular momentum part. This thing is D phi squared. And uh, the way to find that out is to uh, use this formula, back equal to this, and uh, also use um, uh, the formula over here, namely the formula for LC, where the hell is that? It's over here. Let's use this expression. So, um, I'm going to make that a homework problem. Any questions? All right, so let's see. Let me use this board for one last part. While I'm erasing it, I'll tell you a story. Presumably, most of you have heard. Um, when Gandhi, the Indian politician, uh, visited England, one of the English journalists interviewed him. I think it must have been the days of radio, so it was a radio, maybe a print journalist or a radio journalist, said, uh, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think of European civilization? And Gandhi replied, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> and that's very important. Evidently quick on his feet. Um, Okay, well, I hope I've got enough space here. Brad square, which by the way is often written as simply a triangle just to make things, it's just a notation that makes things a hell of a lot easier when you save a little bit of chalk. 
sum i over 1 to 3 partial to partial x i squared. That's the thing in rectangular coordinates. Now, I'm going to just take for granted that the spherical coordinates, that's 1 over r squared d by dr, r squared d by dr, plus d by d theta, sine theta, d by d theta, divided by sine theta. Now, this, I should have written this a little bit differently. Let me put the plus 1 over sine theta. So this sine theta is to the left of all the d by d thetas. And then plus uh, 1 over sine squared theta, d by d t squared. So that's what the philosophy is. By the way, I put a link on the 522 webpage to my class notes for, that I used, that I developed for 466, which are uh, in the form of a huge PDF form. And so those of you who are curious about more about the algebra can go to chapter 2 in that, um, or group theory, you can go to chapter 2 and read about that. Um, you can also, um, if you want to find out more about Laplacians and spherical coordinates or what, you can go to chapter, I don't remember what it is, chapter on tensors. It's a mixture of tensors and general relativity. And you can um, look in there for a derivation of this expression. Or you can find it elsewhere. Okay, so what is R P squared? Because this is cause what enters the is the essential part of the kinetic part of the Hamiltonian for single non-nodalistic particle. And uh, this is clearly minus h bar squared uh, grad dot grad of um, R psi or equivalently minus h bar squared Laplacian psi of R is another way of saying it. And however you write it then in spherical coordinates it's minus h bar squared over R squared and then this huge expression here d by dr R squared d by dr plus 1 over sine theta d by d theta sine theta d by d theta uh, plus d by d t squared over sine squared theta on r side. Now, if you compare this with what we've got over there, you can see that this is equal to minus h bar squared over r squared d by dr of r squared d by dr of r psi plus 1 over r squared r l squared psi. So this takes the essential part of the kinetic part of the Hamiltonian, gives you an expression involving r, and then an expression 1 over r squared the, the matrix element of L squared. And so, of course, if you are in a state, and of course you, you certainly want to do this, if, you have a, if your Hamiltonian is spherically symmetric, then the uh, angular, then L will commute with H, L squared will commute with H, and you can simultaneously diagonalize both H and L squared. In that case, psi can be a state we call it ln since it's angular momentum, the orbital angular momentum. Um, and then this would be, in that case, this thing would be um, I'm trying to find space here. Let me just do this. It would be ditto and then uh, plus h bar squared L, L plus 1 over r squared uh, just simply times r sine. So in other words, all this angular part, all the complexity of the angular part is just gone. It's just 
in the form of h bar squared L plus 1 over R squared, and then you have the derivatives acting on the repulsion with respect to R. And now the angular part of this doesn't involve R, so you can forget about that. And so this just then becomes an ordinary differential equation in the variable R, second order um, uh, and uh, so that's second order linear ordinary differential equation. But not so bad. I mean, it's not trivial. And in fact, um, for an arbitrary potential, spherically symmetric, the um, nobody's ever written down the solutions. Um, even a series, let alone this closed form, but for some, in some cases, it's had been worked out in detail, for example, a hydrogen atom in the other cases. All right, I guess that's everything that we've done long, long enough. So are there any questions? There have been zero questions today. That is not good. Can you, why don't you turn the thing off? Yeah. Um, so I'll save the chocolate for another day.